Hey everybody, it's uh, really nice to be able to present this work at TQC this year. I am sad that I wasn't able to make it in person and that neither were my two co-authors, Shilin Huang, who is now at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and Vadim Klitschnikov, who is at Microsoft Quantum. This is work that I did while I was also at Microsoft and where Shilin at the time was an intern, and now I'm at IBM. A major goal of quantum error correction these days is to be able to design provably fault tolerant gates in a variety of settings. And so what I mean by that is we might have some uh, hardware that we're allowed to apply operations to and the operations could be faulty, they might go wrong. So for example, this is an illustration of a, a circuit where each wire in this circuit represents a physical qubit and then each of the little components represents some physical operation that you can perform on your uh, hardware qubits and the overall effect of this circuit should be to implement some specific logical operation on information which is encoded say in some quantum error correcting code and moreover we want it to be the case that uh, if something goes wrong on the, at the level of the hardware or some small number of things go wrong, that the overall effect is the same. Uh, it's robust on the logical encoded information. And we would like to be able to, uh, to build a quantum computer. We'd like to be able to be able to have some complete set of logical gates where for each of these, we have some specified circuit written in terms of um, hardware operations that we can apply to implement an arbitrary computation robustly. And of course, these circuits are very complicated, these hardware circuits. So we would like to have some theoretical and ultimately computational tools to be able to analyze them. Specifically, we'd like to be able to verify that a hardware circuit indeed fault tolerantly implements the desired logical gate. We'd also like to be able to in have some theoretical tool to uh, approach to prove that if we have two circuits, two hardware circuits, which are fault tolerant and implement some known logical operations, that when we plug them together, the overall so circuit that they produce also is fault tolerant and implements the composition of the uh, logical operations of each. We would moreover like to be able to modify a hardware circuit if it doesn't achieve this goal. So find some problems with it and be able to to modify it and we would like some tools to help us do that. In this work we provide a theoretical tool to address each of these circuit design uh, goals and we illustrate their use with an example. So more specifically for the class of stabilizer circuits we provide a formalism to define fault tolerance for logical operations and this formalism leverages known literature on space-time circuits, space-time code, sorry. We introduce a time-local composition property such that if it's, this property is exhibited by a set of circuits, then when we compose them together, the overall circuit inherits, each, the, inherits the fault tolerance properties of the circuits that we are composing together. We also, with the goal of uh, taking a circuit that isn't quite fault tolerant or doesn't correct for as many faults as, as we would like, we formalize and generalize the notion of a hook error, which is essentially a fault which can cause outsized problems for a quantum error correction circuit. And we also introduce algorithms to find these um, hook errors in specific circuits. Our example is a logical implementation of the Hadamard for the surface code. And this is quite similar to a recent, um, another recent proposal by the River Lane group. We focus on the class of stabilizer circuits, which is a rich class, but these circuits involve the preparation in poly basis states, such as zero or plus, Clifford unitary gates, poly measurements, which can output, uh, which will output a bit 
of information represented by the double line. Um, we also allow for multi-qubit Pauli measurements such as ZZ and we allow for classically controlled uh, gates which are controlled on the outputs of previous measurements. In this work we're interested in stabilizer circuits which actually form what we call stabilizer channels which means that they have the property that if the input state is in the code space of some stabilizer code with the stabilizer group S in, then the, there's a guarantee that the output of the state coming out of the stabilizer circuit will be in the code space of some other stabilizer code with um, stabilizer group S out as shown here. And <clears throat> this is actually a very interesting and useful class of circuits. Um, it covers a lot of what we're interested in fault tolerant um, quantum error correction. In particular, it covers uh, essentially fault tolerant quantum error correction and stabilizer operations of all stabilizer codes um, and stabilizer code based constructions, including topological stabilizer codes such as the surface code and color codes, um, but also much more general codes, LDPC codes, concatenated schemes, etc. And it also includes uh, codes that change over time, such as the Floquet codes or space-time codes. While it's broad as described, it doesn't include everything. And in particular, it does not account for circuits that have non-Clifford operations in them. So for example, a magic state factory would not be included by this formalism. We couldn't analyze the fault tolerance properties of the magic state factory itself. However, it does still plug into this formalism in the sense that if you had some magic state distillation factory and you could guarantee that you produced um, encoded magic states of a certain property in the input code, then you can input that state and indeed any arbitrary state to um, a stabilizer channel analyzed in this way and all of the anal analysis and guarantees that you get for the stabilizer circuits would carry through for the overall uh, system, including the non-Clifford parts. So I wanted to kind of give some brief intuition about what faults look like in stabilizer channels. The idea is that we have some, for some given circuit, like the example circuit that's sketched here, we have some specific finite set of allowed faults that can occur. And these include, for example, poly operators on individual qubits or multi-qubit poly operators, um, and also outcome flips of measurements that occur in the circuit. And you can follow through the effect of uh, such a fault through the circuit. For example, this flip that I showed here, um, th that flips the outcome and therefore flips the control of the classically controlled NOT gate that follows, and that the effect of that fault then propagates through the circuit and can change other measurement outcomes, et cetera, and leave some residual Pauli operator at the end of the circuit. And the idea then is that um, the circuit will contain some set of detectors, also known as checks, also known as stabilizers. Um, there's lots of different names. The, this is work that has been covered in space-time codes and the detector formalism, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of ways to think about these things but all of them amount to the same basic idea is that there is some check matrix for the circuit where each column in the check matrix corresponds to one of the faults that can occur. And the detectors, the whatever it is that it's able to detect the faults that occur in the circuit and um, therefore correspond to the rows. And so a specific fault is just a one column where there are ones for each of the detectors that will flag whenever that fault occurs. And to calculate the um, syndrome, the observed consequences of any set of faults, we can just use this uh, linear equation here, where the fault vector encodes the fault that the, the set of faults that occurred. Similarly, I won't go into details, but similarly, there's some logical effect matrix, which tracks the logical action of each fault. So here again, columns are correspond to faults that can occur just as they do for the check, the channel check matrix. 
but rows now correspond to logical bits that can be flipped by um, the faults that occur. And a logical fault configuration F <clears throat> is a particular uh, fault vector which has the property that it has no syndrome, so H uh, acting on the fault vector gives zero, but it does have some logical action. L acting on F gives um, something that's not zero. And then an important quantity is the fault distance for a particular stabilizer circuit, which is just the, the Hamming weight of the smallest, or the smallest Hamming weight of a fault which satisfies this, this above pair of conditions. <clears throat> and that's important or useful because the um, fault distance tells us the error correction power of the circuit. In particular, we can use a minimum weight decoder to correct up to half of the fault distance of the circuit. At this point, let's take a brief aside to describe a, an algorithm which is useful in this context and that will uh, turn out to be important for us later. So suppose we have a black box algorithm for finding the fault distance of some stabilizer channel. So that means that given the check matrix H and the logical action matrix L, we can compute the distance D. Um, so there are cases when the, this can be done efficiently. Um, for example, if H is uh, the adjacency matrix of some graph, so imagine the graph that I've shown a part of over here, then in this case, the, um, the minimum weight vector, fault vector F, such that H acting on it gives zero and L acting on it is non-zero, is some cycle in the graph. And the reason for that is just because the vertices of the adjacency matrix correspond to nodes, the edges correspond to faults, and in a cycle each node is touching two faults and therefore has a satisfied syndrome because it's touching an even number of uh, faults. So <clears throat> what we would like to know, um, we would like to use such a black box algorithm, which could be a graph-based algorithm as I've described above, but maybe H doesn't correspond to the adjacency matrix of a graph, and so then it would be something more general. but I would like to ask the following question. Suppose we have some edge or set of edges, like the pair of edges shown here, and we want to know, is this a part of some minimum weight uh, configuration? So is it part of some minimum weight logical operator? And you know, we drew this other um, cycle over here, or a part of it, you can imagine it goes outside of the picture, but we drew this other green cycle over here, but there might be other cycles which have the same minimum weight as that one, which do include this, uh, this weight here. For example, this cycle that I just added. Um, and this might initially not be an obvious uh, question to answer, but it's quite simple to just rerun the distance calculation, but on a slightly different fault set. One where we have added an additional edge, but with the edge being um, having a slightly reduced weight of the edge that we are, or the pair of edges in this case, that we're trying to check. Then if you rerun the distance calculation and you find that the distance has been reduced, then it must be the case that the original edge was contained within a minimum weight logical operator. Let's turn to the topic of hook faults or hook errors. This is something which comes up in lots of fault tolerant um, literature. And I think it's something which has lacked a general and rigorous definition. And so that's something that we tried to do in, in this work to, to maybe unify the different uh, pictures of what hook faults are. So first of all, what's the kind of canonical example? Well, here's a picture of the, the surface code. Um, blue checks are the X checks and the the yellow ones are the Z checks. So this vertical green uh, set of five qubits is a Z type logical operator. <clears throat> and here, if you wanna actually measure the stabilizers with um, circuits, then you introduce ancilla qubits and you 
can apply these short little um, circuits to measure each stabilizer. So hopefully this is familiar um, to, to the audience. Then a fault can occur in this circuit, which can cause problems. And we say that that fault is a hook fault if the single fault that occurs propagates to, to two um, Pauli errors on the data qubits as shown here in this example. And depending on the precise details of the circuit, you will have different um, hook faults. So here, for example, I'm specifying a family of circuits by uh, writing A, B, C, D, um, which is the ordering of um, this circuit applied to the, to the stabilizers here just by geometry. So if we fix an ordering, like the one shown here, then this will fix um, the set of hook faults that arise in, in this um, surface code. And in particular, this hook fault that I showed here corresponds to this vertical um, pair of, of qubits. So um, this is a problem in this particular example because as I said, the vertical set of five qubits is the logical Z operator and this single fault that can arise um, which is a hook fault, produces a weight two part of that weight five logical operator, meaning that the um, fault distance of the, this implementation of the surface code has a distance three rather than the full distance five of this uh, code as drawn. And a different choice of circuits would not have that problem. This is well known. And um, if you reorder, which you might not have seen there, but I, these numbers changed since the last uh, update, um, then the hook, this hook fault uh, lies perpendicular to the logical operator and you achieve the full distance. So clearly understanding hook faults is something that's very important for circuit design um, when trying to achieve uh, a good fault distance. And um, to my knowledge, this term was first introduced in the Denison all paper in the surface code. And the idea there, um, well, why are they called hooks? The idea there is that the check matrix has this property that it is the adjacency matrix of some graph. And so uh, for the surface code, you indeed have faults corresponding to edges in, in the graph and nodes corresponding to uh, checks. And so this is, for example, the X type uh, graph here, the graph corresponding to the X type stabilizers. And this particular Z fault looks like a little hook. It goes around a corner. Um, there's also a, another more generalized view also discussed in the Denison all paper where you look at the time dimension as well as just the, the space dimension. And then you can have hook, hook faults where hooks, where these errors correspond not just to weight to poly operators, but also to bit flip of measurement outcomes and uh, poly operators. And they have this like hook in space time as well. Okay, so there's lots of ways of thinking about these hooks. Um, they arise not just in the surface code, but in other codes too, where you don't have edges, etc., and things get quite complicated. Um, but it is clear that an understanding and analysis of hook faults is crucial for understanding fault tolerant circuits. Um, and it would be nice to have a less ad hoc uh, definition of these things. So in particular, we would like to have a general definition of hook faults for any stabilizer channel and um, a characterization of those hook faults which cause problems, which um, result in a low fault distance for a particular circuit, and then algorithms to aid the analysis. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So first of all, um, let's think about generalizing the definition of hook faults. So what we propose in this work is to define hook faults, in fact, with respect to any subset of faults that can occur in a circuit. So <clears throat> in this case, then a fault is a hook fault if it's not in the subset. So the subset is somehow a subset of faults that you can handle easily, that you know that you should be able to, that, that you understand well and you know that you should be able to correct with little difficulty. And then the hook faults are faults that are not in that set. And the fault distance then of the circuit must be um, upper bounded by the 
distance of this that you would get if you only had the subset of faults occurring. Things only get worse when you add more faults. And this definition recovers the standard definition whenever the subset is the single qubit um, polys in the 2D case or the phenomenological noise. <clears throat> and you can kind of specify this more explicitly for the, for the surface code. So if then you have the, the fault distance for the full set of faults being strictly less than the fault distance for just the subset, um, if that's the case, then there must be some problematic hook faults that are responsible. There must be some faults outside of the subset which are causing this distance to be reduced. And we would like to characterize those. Those are the ones which will need to be handled in order to um, improve the, if you want to make a change to the circuit so that um, it performs better, so that the distance is increased. So the first type of uh, hook fault that we um, consider is a, is a brazen hook, which is essentially a hook which is a minimum weight, which is part of a minimum weight logical fault configuration for just the understandable subset of faults. And removing all brazen, uh, and essentially the idea then is that um, a hook fault builds up more than one edge in this, uh, more than one fault of that um, logical fault configuration. So removing all brazen hook faults is necessary. This is the, the example that we saw um, for the surface code earlier was an example of this. And removing all uh, brazen hook faults is a necessary but not sufficient condition in order to achieve the, the full distance. Um, on the other hand, we have um, another type of hook hazardous hook faults. So this, this type is necessary but not sufficient. Um, we have another type of hook faults which are sufficient but not necessary. So if you remove all of them, then you are guaranteed to achieve full distance. Um, and both of these are important to understand. And both of these can be addressed by the algorithm that I, both of these can be efficiently found by the algorithm, efficiently identified by the algorithm that I described um, earlier. Okay, and the last thing that I wanted to, to um, mention was the example that we analyzed by using these techniques and this is essentially an implementation of a logical Hadamard for the surface code. This is drawn at a sketch at a topological level here and it's as I mentioned earlier it's um, quite similar to the approach that is um, that came out a little before our paper um, by the River Lane group. The idea here is that we build a circuit and um, you can't see very clearly here, I'll zoom in in a second, but each round in this circuit is a specific, um, there is a specific ordering assigned to how stabilizers are extracted for different, it, for different uh, versions of the surface code which sm slowly grows over time and builds the the topological picture that I showed in the previous slide. And um, notice a number of things. First of all, the circuit on this uh, surface code patch here is not uniform. So these two uh, circuits here are for extracting Z-type logical operate or Z-type stabilizers, sorry, but they are not the same as one another. And the reason for that is that this um, tile here is not, uh, it, it has some sp re spatial variation. And so in order to ensure that you achieve the largest uh, fault distance possible, you actually require the spatial variation. <clears throat> Another thing is that uh, we have temporal variation. So actually um, it's hard to see, but this pair of patches here is actually the same surface code patch, but different circuits are used to measure 
the um, stabilizers in each of these two versions of the same patch. And the reason is actually because uh, history matters here and what the fact that this patch um, comes right after this causes some logical operators which um, can arise for this patch to drift into this one in the time dimension, um, whereas this one comes right before this. And so this uh, has to be designed uh, with time, with what happened before and after in mind in order to achieve full tolerance. <clears throat> okay, and that brings us to the end of the talk. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Um, in summary, we, we introduced some definitions that I hope will be useful for the fault distance and generalized hook faults for stabilizer channels. Um, we gave some, well, I gave a sketch of some explicit algorithms that could be used to analyze the fault distance and find the uh, different kinds of hook faults. And um, I didn't talk about it in the talk, but we provide a um, composition rule to ensure that the fault distance is preserved when you compose circuits together. And here are a number of open questions that I hope will be of interest to the community. Thanks very much.